Everybody ready? Come on, let's go. Three, four, show! Yo, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rick Thorne. How's everybody doing? On this episode, I got my homie that I've known for a long time. It's Dingo from Monster Energy. Dingo, what is up? How are you, man? I'm good. I'm, um, man, I'm like trying to like get my new driver's license and people are saying that you've got to get a uh, California real ID so you can fly like next year. And I don't really understand what any of that means. I'm not very good at paperwork, dude. I assume you're not very good at paperwork either. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. They, they said you have to do what with your license in order to fly? So, so like, starting starting next year, you're going to need a California real ID to be able to get on an airplane. So what do you have right now, Australia? I, I have a California ID. No, dude. This is like, there's like a new form of ID coming out that needs to be a real ID so you're able to fly. So it's not just your regular California driver's license. So anybody that has a California driver's license is going to have to go and get this real ID so you can get on an airplane. I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it, it does to me. You know what it's called? It's called cha-ching, another way to get more money. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're very right. You're very right. I mean. The, the richest state in America, or one of them, you know that California is like the sixth biggest economy in the world, but yet potholes all over the place where the broker state, you know why you're not Eric? Because nobody pays taxes here. That's what it is. Everybody that lives here has a house here, keeps their money in Bahamas, and doesn't pay any taxes. That's how it works. Okay, here's my complaint about people that live here that are born and raised in the United States that don't pay taxes. Start paying them. Yeah. Don't complain I about. Didn't pay don't, my taxes. Don't complain about. I didn't pay my taxes for a while, Rick. Wait, I'm gonna ta- <laughs> I'm gonna take that out. I'm not gonna put that in the show. They're gonna bust your ass, bro. <laughs> They're like listening right now. <laughs> oh no, I got caught. No, no, trust me. They're listening to me right now. They've been on my ass. They've been on my ass for ten years. They got me ten years ago, and and they check in every day. <laughs> <laughs> they're my homies, dude. I got I got I got like a whole other bank account set up for them. It's like they're flush funds. <laughs> they're ruthless. There's no way around it. Like you, you, no. you, you've got you've got to contribute, and it sucks because. We live here in California, and we make this, well, listen, we're very lucky, but, like, we have, like, you know, the highest, like, tax rate here. It's, you know, it costs a lot of money to live here. you got to make a lot of money to live in California. Like, triple the amount if you live anywhere else. I know. I mean, do you realize how much I'm getting paid for this podcast? Millions! Millions! That's what I figured, man. That's why I answered <laughs> straight away. <laughs> Yeah, bro. <laughs> Residuals are coming in off the Rick Thorne show. Ching, 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 ching. I kind of love that you're doing a podcast, though. Like, it's a perfect fit for you. It's cool. Well, listen, dude, I don't have any friends, and this is my time to reconnect with everyone and record it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what's funny, dude? I've known you for a long time, and I didn't know your name was Luke. So I just looked you up online. You did it? No, because you've always been Dingo to me. I didn't know your name was Luke. Wow. And tell me if I say your last That's name right. Because like Trembath. You remember? Do you remember the first time we met? I do. Wait, but, but I do too. But let me back up. It's Luke Trembath. Yeah, it's it. Luke Trembath. T-R-E-M-B-A-T-H. Google I, it. I know. I, yeah, Google Luke Trembath. You'll see Dingo. You've always been Dingo to me, bro. You haven't said, "Hey, hi, my name's Luke." Or Mr. Trimbath, no, can you please come to the principal's office? I wasn't in that world then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I wasn't in school for very long either. No, I do. I do remember the first time we met. Two thousand five. Yeah, about two thousand five. Two thousand five, and you're like, yeah, right. And yeah, and I was hanging out with a girl that you were hanging out with. That were friends. That yeah, were friends. You in my world are an icon, like. Growing up in, like, out of the city, Australia, like, it was BMX and skateboarded. I was more surrounded around by people that, like, cared about BMX. So I like, knew more about the BMX world than I did, say, like, the skateboard world. I just kind of had skateboards because everyone had a skateboard. Right. And it was like, yeah, like, I knew who Rodney Mullen was. You know, you, you follow it. But, like, I think, like, following BMX, because I, like, raced BMX, I was taking a knock fall as a kid. So my elders who got me into action sports were, like, super fans of yours. 
you've always been like a rock star to me from the beginning, since I was a kid. There wow. are like certain people in your life are these like iconic people, and you were one of those iconic people for me as a kid. It was like there was the Michael Jordan poster, and then there's the Rick Thorne poster. Damn, you know? I, I was, was like, wait, wait, I was next to Jordan? Yeah, Damn. like fucking crazy, right? Oh, shit. <laughs> Oh, shit. Hey, listen, listen. I'm super complimented. I'm actually blushing right now because, Diego, you're my dog, dude. And, like, check it out, bro. I've met people before. I'd be like, I really like this person, and I, I'm really – I idolize – not idol, I don't idolize, but I'm like, oh, this is one of my heroes. I love this person. It inspired me. And I meet him, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I wish I would have never met that asshole. Am I, did, yeah. I live, did I live up to next – Did I? am I still cool? Did, did, when you met me, was I like, oh, this guy, he wasn't what I thought he was. He's a jerk. No, no, no! You completely lived up to it. You're the same person that you, that you are, that you come off back then as you are now, that you were then when I met you. To the same person you are now, you know. And I think me and you have had that conversation of like, you know, over the years, you know, because I'm now in somewhat, I feel like event, you know, like I show up to like snowboard competitions and feel like nobody knows me, and it's like that weird, awkward thing. You're like, hey, and it's like the kids are all super respectful, but like me and you have now vetted to the point where like. You kind of see people come and go, but we're still there, right? Like, right. We're still there, pushing what we love and doing what we love. We never got a real job. We were like, "Fuck that! We're never getting a real job." Well, see, well, and, well, and our jobs, our jobs, more difficult than a real job, anyways. You know that. One thousand percent, dude. There's no, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know if we're going to be safe tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day after that. And we just kind of went for it. But it was funny. I went from that, and then it was like BMX, skateboarding, surfing, like, and they were the things I was into. Snowboarding just happened to be the thing that I was the best at. I was put on a snowboard when I was like six, and I was just super into it. But like growing up where I did in Australia, like, you know, a couple hours outside of Melbourne on the morning peninsula, it was like road dirt bikes, you surf, you skateboarded, you rode BMX, and winters we snowboarded. And I wasn't that good at the other ones. Like, I grew up like three hours away from my resort. I was junior national champion by the time I was like 11. Wow. So snowboarding was like the thing that I got put onto it, and snowboarding, like, was, I was just that much better than everyone, so naturally. But the first ever sponsorship letter I ever wrote to anyone, I wrote a sponsorship letter to Mongoose. I wrote a sponsorship letter to Redline. Like, I wrote sponsorship letters to BMX companies ever before I did snowboard companies. <laughs> oh, BMX is in your blood, son. I love it. <laughs> and then back in the day, those companies would still reply letters to you saying no. But you'd get the Mongoose letter saying no in the fucking mail, dude. Like, that's just gangster. Yeah, but you went for it yourself, dude. How old were you when you wrote letters to sponsors? I mean, I admire this. I was nine. I was nine and ten years of age writing sponsorship letters and, like, dreaming of, like, man, like, what would it be like to have just, like, a room full of products? Had those dreams, right? And then it was, like, my dad got me into snowboarding um, because my dad grew up skiing and my brother's five years older and he was actually a really good skier, freestyle skier, so I was always in the snow. So it was just, I had those weekends and I got put on a snowboard when I was six my dad started snowboarding with me, snowboard around with this, like, fanny pack, and it was full of Mars bars, right? And th that would be the only way he me to come and eat. He knew he had the Mars bars, so I'd never go too far away from him because I would come to get the Mars bars to keep eating to stay out in the snow. <laughs> wait, 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 so he had, he, had a, he had a hip sack full of candy, Mars bars, and you say, okay, come here, like, and you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... Look, that's a little fat kid syndrome too, you know what I'm saying? Hey, you know, I need I need to do that with my daughter with surfing, but it's got to be mocha frappuccinos from Starbucks. This is going to be an expensive, big yeah. ass hip sack. It's going to be huge. That's just the world we live in now. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's interesting that that you first wanted to ride BMX, then you got into snowboarding, and then when was it when you came over to the states? So it was. I, defer, I, I came to America a few times before I lived here. The first trip I ever did was in like nothing a. And I was only, like, 11, and I did a trip with the Australian ski and snowboard team, and I went to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and it's ironic because that's where I ended up moving back to when I came back to live for the first year. And I did, like, a couple trips, like, because we have, like, our time off is, um, our time off, our summer is your winter, vice versa. Right. I'd be spending, like, December, January over here training, and then I did my first junior world competition in France, and that was 99, 2000. That was 2000, and I actually blew my knee out, and at that time, like, my dad had kind of, my dad had kind of left us, and 
it was just my mom and my brother, and my brother was dealing with a lot of just his own issues. And I blew my knee out in France. I ended up qualifying for the finals, and I like qualified like top 16th or something. And this was like Sean White was competing, Danny, Cass. Like, this is the first time I met all these people that would end up being friends of mine for life. We'd end up going into this industry or going in being pro snowboarders together. I had basically blown my knee out. I ended up getting scabies in France too, which was super disgusting. Wait, wait, wait. Um, wait you got, got scabies. How'd you get that, dude? Dude, I think I got it from, like, gloves or, like, who the fuck knows that I got it being in their weird fucking hospital when I blew my knee out. Anyway, so, like, <laughs> I kind of don't even know why I said that. <laughs> um, That's all anyway, right. but I'm, like, back home in Australia. I'm on crutches. I've got my blown-out knee. I got skaties. You know, you feel like it's the end. But the head coach, and, like, the head coach of the U.S. team, a guy named Mike Mellon, had reached out and been like, hey, like, I think if we could get you over here and train, I think, that, you know, that that would be beneficial for you and us, and so, like, I had this opportunity, I had a small, like, sponsorship from Oakley at the time, so I was, like, sponsored by Oakley. Right. And it came to the point where, like, my dad had, my dad was gone, and my brother was, like, a mess, and he was of age, so he was 18, and he moved out of the house, and, like, caught up the wrong crowd, drugs, whatever, like, just, like, super, like, kind of mixed up, and uh, this opportunity, and mom was like, fuck it, she, like, sold the car, put everything up, and we moved to America, not even knowing what we were doing in 2000. Wait, wait, like, wait. So you, so, so you and your mom both moved? Yep. So mom came. She was here for like nearly, she was there for like seven months. My mom came, moved to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. She got a job as a janitor and was cleaning apartments. And, and I was going to the public high school in Steamboat Springs. And I did my first year at Steamboat Springs High School uh, training, with the, uh, training with the U.S. team. And it got to the point, like, that summer, coming to that summer, she had no visa, she had nothing. She was working basically illegally under the table, fucking cleaning houses, dude, like, super gnarly. And I basically at that time, I basically at that time didn't, uh, had, she had to go back to Australia, and it was like, all right, like, the mecca of snowboarding was moving to Mammoth. Danny had moved to Mammoth. The U.S. team that I had been training with, everything was, like, diverted. And a guy named Joe Eddy, who was living in Seamoat Springs and with his mom and sister, um, were moving to Mammoth. And it was like, all right, like, one year in Seamoat Springs, and then my mom had to move back home, and it was like, I, I was not ready to go home. And I went and moved in with Joe, Eddie, and his mom, who were from Steamboat. And then I started sleeping on a couch at, like, 15 years of age, trying to go to high school, doing homeschool, and then basically as an amateur snowboard. I was sleeping on this, like, tiny couch with his family that didn't have much money either and I was pitching in a little bit but literally living on a couch going to high school moving to Mammoth to like make my to live my dream right and like that was the mecca of snowboarding and that's where I met Danny that's where Grenade started in Mammoth around that time well wait 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 let this, sorry, like, listeners know Grenade was a collab that you and Danny did together right or not a collab an yeah. actual company that you guys did together correct? a company yeah is it still around Grenade sold it. Yeah, so Grenade sold, like, so Grenade was like a movement, so Danny and Matt, uh, Matt Cass from uh, New Jersey, and they'd moved out in, in, into Mammoth, and Grenade in 2000 had bought the gas station in June Lake, and basically it was just a bunch of kids, literally like 50 snowboarders, and it was the first company, like, made by snowboarders for snowboarders at that time. Like, yeah, there's Burton and all these other things, but we were the revolutionary, we were the misfits, we were just the young kids, that all loved one thing, and that was the snowboard, we started causing, like, a huge ruckus on the scene. And we were literally just a band of misfits. And it was not a company. It was a company. It was it was way more than just a company. It was a band of brothers and sisters that traveled together, lived together, spray-painted shit, lived out of vans. Like, we were the punk rock fucking snowboarders come in and say, hey, like, fuck you. This is the new movement. And that movement went from 2001 to two, 2002, Danny... Uh, Rock Powers and J.J. Uh, Thomas swept the podium at the uh, 2002 Olympics in Park, Park City. The first time in 52 years that the Americans had swept the podium. So all of a sudden, snowboarding got put onto this main, mainstream level. So here we go from punk rock fucking kids to mainstream level and getting corporate deals. And then that was it. That was the beginning of the 2000s. And you were there for it. Like, that mecca that then ran to, you know, I'd say we ran it all the way into the TV show to like 2012, 2013. But like, 
from 02 to like 08, 09 was like the mecca of like, I would say, action sports and like big money dollars. And for snowboarding, we became the kings. Like Grenade, the company itself, became one of the biggest selling snowboard brands in Zoomies, in all these things. Like we were out selling Quicksilver. We were out selling Burton Outerwear and gloves. Like we fucking, were, and we were just a bunch of shit bag kids. Like the first boxes we sent out, we made the shittiest products. Like you'd wipe your nose on, the, uh, on your gloves and your nose would bleed because there was just plastic hanging off them. And, like, we were shipping gloves and pouring, like, empty 40 cans and empty beers and putting them in our boxes and sending out boxes to the snowboard shops. So like, it was, like, real deal cool. Like, it was, like, it was, it, it, in my mind, that shit will never happen again, right? And it's, like, that moment of the once in a lifetime of how things will happen. And Grenade, in my opinion, the way that it was sold and the way that it went down, like, it was never going to last forever. It was always going to be a moment in time. And it was more about the people and the movement in that moment in time not about this long-lasting, like, oh, it's going to be around forever and it's going to sell for $60 million because that's what everyone told us for fucking however long. People always were like, you're going to sell it for $100 million. You're going to sell it for $50 million. You're the next DC. You're the next Burton. You're the next this. You're the next Volcom. And yeah, like, there was probably a moment in time where we could have stood back and sold it for not that amount of money, but a huge amount of money. And instead, we just kept it riding, kept it riding, kept it riding. And unfortunately, the time fell off, and it fell back, and it fell back. And, you know, when we offloaded the brand, it was, it was too late. What was that span from when you started feeling like, okay, I got this grenade thing going with Danny, and we're going to blow up? Like, how many years was that where you were kind of on the couch trying to figure this out? You know what I mean? On the couch for, like, two and a half years. And, like, it was like I had ended up then moving in with Danny and, like, sleeping on Danny's couch, and, and it all kind of went from there. You know, I went from sleeping as a teenager, still as a teenager, and then and then on the Eddie's couch, and then it moved to Danny's couch, and then it kind of, then kind of escalated, and then like the bond between me and Danny just kind of never went away. Like even in our height of success, we were still living in that two bedroom apartment. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, that's a way to save the money that you're making too. You know, right? What I mean? We drive, we had buses and everything, dude, and we were just still fucking. Leave it on the fucking couch together. <laughs> so, so, so I met you. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. So, wait. So, I met you. If I met you in 2005, which is true, then you would have been like at the, uh, at the, uh, not the peak of it, but in the kind of in the middle of the grenade days when you guys were like, this is, this is cool. We're living it right here, right? Yeah. 2005, right? 2005, 2006. Then Danny's next Olympics was 2000. 2006, and then he won his second silver medal. And that's when Sean won his first one. Got it. Got it. So you, you built your success with Grenade, but you've also worked with like a number of, you've done a number of different events, haven't you? You've hosted a number of different things, haven't you? Yeah, well, that was kind of like, for me, like, it was like this like pro snowboarder in the mecca of it with Grenade. And then like the editor of Snowboarder Magazine, like, kind of handed me a microphone, Pat Bridges, when I was like 18, 17, which would then lead me into another whole world. And I ended up becoming, like, the biggest host, live host in snowboarding. And in, in my opinion, one of the best of all time. Like, I ended up hosting the U.S. Open four years in a row and hosted every single major snowboard competition as a teenager. And for me, it was like I'd become, the ho like, the snowboarder's host because I was still a snowboarder. Like, I was there on the microphone, but I could still get in the half pipe or get on a jump and do basically the same stuff they could do. Right. They were just a little bit better. So, for me, it was giving that knowledge and giving some from real knowledge into the sport that kind of needed it at the time. And and I was able to transcend that into becoming like one of the, you know, most popular snowboard MCs of all time and transcend that into, you know, media and television and started hosting the TV shows. Um, uh, you know, putting, I was like, when you were hosting 54321, that's when they started like leaking me into fuel, which then ended up like, MTV Made was like the thing that kind of then put me over the edge. I think that was like 2000. That came out, 2006, I think that came out, and that was when I was the MTV made snowboard coach. So I was already 18 at the time. So that put me on, that was an MTV. Like, I remember the ratings in that show. Like, I, I think about it now. Like, that show aired to like 14 million people. Like, that's like, that's like, that's like, like fucking voice final finale now. Or well, that doesn't even get that much. So that was back in that time, pre internet, pre, it was still like, man, like, you're on MTV. That's that one time you walk down the street and people recognize you because they watched it. Right. Whereas now everything's so diluted. But from that, that night gave me the bug. And, you know, that was around the same time 
Tierdick did MTV, while the big, you were there on that first episode and, and that first season, and that kind of gave me the, the urge to be like, fuck, we can do this. And like Danny never wanted to be on television. He was always kind of a recluse and never wanted a part of it, but I was able to convince him that if we do this, it would help our company in what we needed to do. So that was when we kind of bonded together and started, uh, that was when we were able to start pitching the TV show stuff and Fuel TV just kind of ended up being a home. Um, yeah, it wasn't a mainstream thing, but in, in, in fairness, it probably worked out better for me because I feel like being the face of core, our core industry, was kind of what our industry needed. And, and for me to be the face of Fuel TV for that time and have a, have a reality show that like kind of showed the back end and still today, like, snowboard kids are like, man, that, like, really changed the way I thought about snowboarding and what I was able to do because you didn't have to, you, you could create a lifestyle out of it. So, like, it was kind of funny how I, like, paved ways a little bit, even, like, super random, but, like, that rapper kid, little van, I ran into that kid, like, recently, and, and he tripped out because he, like, was like, dude, I grew up, like, watching your show, blah, 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 like, this is what you did for me. I always wanted to be a pro snowboarder, but I was never that good, so it's funny that, like, the people that resonated with that, like, back in the day. Well, yeah. What was the name of the show again? The Adventures of Danny and Dingo. Of course. We got to let them know. So you can look it up, too. Now, 49 episodes, dude. We nearly did 50 episodes. We, like, like five seasons, and we went all around the world. So amazing. I remember the show, but the new listeners might not, so I want to give them the, the no. title so you can check it out. But me and you have, me and you have a lot in common. In the sense of hosting and personality, because me and you have a lot of personality. And the reason I bring this up is because sometimes people haven't respected me. Right. You know? Oh, oh, dude, I, but like, like, it, like people, it, it, people. It, it, it more respect to you, like, people, like, never respected me. It's, it, it's still today, like, I think people see now what I'm doing today, and people are like, wow, like, how is he still around? It's because I've worked my ass off, but, like, I totally get where you're coming from, because... I feel like you had more validity than me. Like, you were fucking the biker in black. You fucking Rick Stone. Like, you've been an OG since the beginning, since the 80s. You know, and people have definitely, like, tried to clown on you or put down on you. And fuck that. Like, well, yeah. And, 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 and you know what? The people that only ever put down on you are just fucking jealous, dude. And of that's course. Where, I've, where I've grown to be. Like, dude, like, even in the height of it, everyone's like, oh, it's only because of Danny or all this shit. Like, I got that my whole, that whole career, right? At the end of the day, like, I was working just as fucking hard, and, 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 and what we did was working, and it took two to tango, and it also took a group of us to make what happened. People just got jealous because of the success that I'd had, but, like, don't get it twisted. Like, man, like, the success I had also was, like, some of the biggest demons I ever had. I fell into a deep depression. I, like, you know, I tried to commit suicide when I was in 2009. Like, it, like, came with a bunch of dark fucking traumas, you know? Wait, so wait, 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 before we go any further. I didn't know about this. 2011? Yeah. Is that what you said? What was that? 2009. 2009. What, what, okay, what, well, do you mind sharing what had happened? Yeah, no, like, I, I talk about it. That's why I talked to high school kids about it, and I've gone and, like, created this whole mental health program with Find Your Grind and, 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 and the nonprofit and the foundation I have, but I fell into it deep, dark depression for, like, a year, man, and it wasn't, it was that I was just lost and confused, and I was too embarrassed to own up to it, so I never spoke about it, but I woke up every day, like, thinking about commit suicide, and was in this dark depression while I was filming a TV show, while we had a company that, you know, 40 people worked for, and was sold into, like, 32 different countries, and it was like I was overwhelmed and, like, lived this strange life, and didn't really know how to deal with it, but then also was too... Uh, was, was, wasn't able to like own up to it because I was too embarrassed to tell my family or my friends or my peers and then I ended up you know knocking back a shitload of pills and fucking woke up in the hospital and had to deal with it so do you think that that stemmed from the level of success or criticism or all of it at one the success all and of it. all of all it right of it. all the attention all, all of it, of it. Yeah, yeah like I wasn't prepared for it and then I wasn't talking to any professionals about it I was just bottling it all up and in the end, I just couldn't hold into it and, you know, want it out. So it became, it became very dark. I get it and I understand it because I've been, I've been there and I've been there and I've done it alone uh, in the sense of dealing with the issues of success and the issues of criticism and whatnot. You have started your own foundation. You, you showed me at, at Agenda. Uh, I, didn't, I had no idea that the Find Your Grind. Talk to me about this. So it was like, the TV show ended, and then Grenade, we were, like, changing 
we were like getting ready to sell. And I took a year off in like 2013 because you're going to think like 2000 to 2013, I'd never have a moment to breathe or stop or be like, man, this is what I'm doing. It just kind of never ended. So I basically took like a year off and was like, I want to figure out what I want to do, you know? And like that point meeting with Jeff Tremaine and MTV and all these people were like, yeah, you're great. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. And like, man, like we all saw like your next success. So like we all wanted to chase it. And when like people that are creating the same shit, you're like, all right, I'm going to go there. And it's like, I know that, you know, I have the talent to be able to do it, but it's, it's also like dropping a needle in a haystack, hitting that success button. Dude, I fucking filmed two MTV pilots over a two-year period, two. Like, MTV spent, like, a couple million dollars on me, and it just wasn't the right time. It was almost, like, a little too late. People were edgy on, like, putting shows out because they didn't want to get the ratings, and, and it just kind of didn't work out. So, it was, for me, it was like, what do you want to do in life? And I'd always wanted to give back and, and do well. And then I'd met Mike Smith at Ryan Sheckler's Golf Tournament, who is a public use speaker, and basically, like, a switch went off, and I said to Gretchen Ryan's mom, like, who is this guy? And I went down and watched him speak at uh, a high school. He lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. I watched him speak at a high school in Orange County, and he made the cool kids uncool and the uncool kids cool in, like, an hour span. And I was like, how did you do that? I ended up getting on an airplane and flying to Lincoln, Nebraska, and, you know, started said, I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm going to help you grow this. And I then was able to start opening up and started in a room full of like 10 kids and told my story about depression. Who These kids were all suicidal and, and all tried to commit suicide. And, and from that moment on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And we started speaking to bigger audiences and bigger audiences. And Find Your Vines then, then became this thing where I was wanting to help out on the education side. I'd worked all these jobs that never had a college degree for. So I wanted to be able to peel back them and say, hey, there are other opportunities in life. You don't need to be a doctor or a lawyer. Here's all the opportunities I've had. And so we've just started growing it. Find Your Grind now is a self-discovery platform that lives in the education system, public education system, has 180 hours curriculum that teaches you about finance, teaches you about insurance, teaches you about everything you need to know in life that nobody ever taught you in school. And then there's assessment tests in there that then show you what strengths and weaknesses you have. And then there's job shadows of hundreds of different people. People from, like, Rob Beardick teaching you about finance. So, like, LAPD officers teaching you about jobs in tech in the, in, in the police department to like, to, like, yoga instructors, to everybody's story and shadowing of how you got there. And it's become this, like, mentorship program. And, yeah, we created a clothing line with messaging, but that's just, that's, just, that's just one of the factors that add on to me creating this education platform. Um, and now growing it, you know, and now it's like you saw it, like we built the, we built this house in Agenda two week, two weekends ago. We built a house in, in, in at ComplexCon and created the Bruce Lee Infinity Room with Steve Aoki and, and had our gaming team there. So it's me being able to take creativity that I learned over the years, going from Trade Children's Grenade, being a part of the clothing industry, being a part of action sports, being a part of these worlds. Now, Find Your Grind is me kind of giving back, but in, 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 in the sense of like me kind of peeling the wool off like a lot of industry and things that haven't been done before and saying, hey, these are the opportunities. You know, nobody wants to nobody wants to be defined by a job. People want to be defined by a lifestyle. That's what you've done. That's what I've done. That's what a lot of our friends have done. So I'm just trying to expose that to the youth and the next generation. That's amazing, dude. It's a self-discovery platform and findyourgrind.com goes into it and there's an individual user experience in there and there's a curriculum that lives in the education system when we do live events to colleges and uh, I'm sorry high schools and we're launching colleges next year and basically it's just find your grind is exactly what it sounds it's gonna it's, you're gonna get on there and find your passion one thing that I wanted to bring up is we're monster energy teammates you yeah. how long have you yep. been with monster so it's funny Tampa and Charlie says you're the longest running guy there I did my contract in 2005. Yeah, I was there before that. Yeah. What were you, O two? 2 No, I was earlier. I did an episode of Monster Garage with Tony Hawk, I think, in 2000. And some guy came up to me and said, hey, we got this energy company, uh, energy drink company called Monster Energy. You should hit us up. And, well, naturally, being my own manager, I was like, well, all right, I'll hit you guys up. And sure enough, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I've never had. I've, hey, yo, let me contact my manager. Yeah. Hey, we're in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold on, let me talk to him real quick. Hey, Rick, so I got this card. Yep, send me the number. All right, got it. Let's call him. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, it's been it's been like 2000. I've been I've been with those guys since then, and you know, obviously they're they've been super supportive and super amazing to every everybody. They they're definitely a company that 
appreciates the work you do for them. And you've done quite a bit of, of stuff for them as well. Were you doing like, were you hiding something on the street recently, like a, a, a egg hunt of some sort of a video game or something? Yeah, like they did the, uh, no, Deadpool 2. So we did this, like, we did this collaboration with Deadpool 2. Mark Hall actually came up with it because it's a mutant drink. And, like, they're trying to, you know, obviously, like, they're going to say quarter action sports. We know that, but they've got to go mainstream and, and, and advertise the market in different areas. So Mutant the Drink was launched uh, in 7-Eleven, and basically Deadpool was the face of the drink. So I had this, like, I'm actually holding it right now, one of my cat, but it was, like, three different mutant sodas with a Deadpool gift certificate and uh, three movie tickets in there. So I dropped one under a gutter here in downtown L.A., and the guy that got it actually works at the Staples Center, so pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. That is cool. Do you have anything coming up with them? Yeah, so, like, basically my new thing now is, like, I'm just doing, like, the Facebook Live. So, like, the first one I did was with Mike Shinoda. Mike Shinoda was a part of the Monster Energy Outbreak Tour. And then I did, like, a live in studio with him. And then last week I did Brian Deegan's Compound. So we're at the the Deegan. And then I'm just kind of going to do, like, one of those every couple of weeks with our athletes. So we've got to get you on there behind the scenes with Rick Bond. Yeah, dude. Let's go ride. Let's go shred some pools or, or hit the vert ramp at Vans. That would be cool, or... dude. Like, just like a city fucking or like a cruise. Like, that's what it is. It's just like a Q&A behind the scenes type thing. I, like, basically pitch them on, hey, we've got the best athletes in the world. We always show the quality, the video, the, after, the aftermath and the product. Why don't we get to know our athletes and go behind the scenes and, do Q and A's and go into that home. Almost like an MTV Crip style. Didn't you have an MTV Crip? Yeah, dude. Mine was voted one of the top ten MTV best cribs ever. Uh, or how, See, that sounded weird. That's what I'm weird, saying, but... dude. So, yeah. Like, I just, just like just regurgitating the same stuff that was done. Just me holding the phone in an organic way. So it's you know it's like yeah. So that's kind of my new deal. So. I'm going to hold you to this. Like, let's do let's do a Facebook live for Monster and go shred some pools, bro. I like that. Okay, cool. Is it? And also, too, uh, I want everybody to, to follow you on Instagram because I love you and I think you're doing great things. You're doing great things for kids, for not only for kids, but for people. Find your grind, as you would say. Uh, give me some Instagrams and some websites again. What's your What's your Instagram? The Dingo in Snow. All my handles: Instagram, Twitter, and then findyourgrind.com for everything else. Dude, I appreciate you taking time to talk to me. Let's hook up that Facebook Live, bro. Let's do it. You're the man, Rick. Love you, brother. I love you, too. Have a great day, bro. Stay rad. Thank you. Thank you, dude. You, too. Stay rad. Fuck yeah.